the service. So I would like to tell you a little about, about the kingship of Jesus, the kingdom. And um, I was praying, I said, God, what do you want me to bring to these people? These are your people. What am I supposed to tell them? Is there something new that I haven't discovered yet? Then please reveal it to me. Is it something old that I just need to remind them? Then please reveal that to me. I really want to know. And so sometimes I get on the computer and I just start typing and I'm, I'm just praying and, and God, you know, is, is I, I, I hope that he's leading my hands in that. If not, please excuse me and forgive me for getting in his way. But this is what came out. It's, it's not a fluffy, puffy sermon about the power of the resurrection of Jesus, but it is when he became a king at that resurrection, when he became the, the crowned king of this eternal kingdom. So the kingdom come, thy will be done. You've heard that. We just studied that in the Lord's Prayer just a little while ago. It's in Matthew chapter 6 as we go through the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. And it was, it was a wonderful a lesson, I think, on how to pray and what prayer does and all of that. But the whole thing about thy kingdom come has confused a lot of folks for a lot of time. Well, I, I thought Jesus was born a king, and he was. Mm -hmm. So why was he praying at 30 years old that thy kingdom come? What, he's, he's asking his Father in heaven about the kingdom come and thy will be done. So does that, does that phrase sound familiar to you? Okay, well, what do you need for a kingdom to come? Any co what, what, what do you need? What, what needs to be there for you to have a kingdom? People. People, okay. What else? Maybe some land, right? Don't kings fight over land? The more land you have, the more crops you can do, the more sheep that can go out there and graze, and the more cattle that can have grass to grow, and more oranges and peaches and pineapples and all that. So you, and, and if you've got land and you've got people to work those, then I think you have a, the makings of a kingdom. So what about a king, though? Isn't the king the top guy and his wife? Isn't she like the, the top uh, dame, as they call it in, in England, the, the lords and, and, and the dames? Well, imagine for a minute that God who created all things including you and including me and this whole earth and the stars and the moon and everything else. Imagine that he wanted to start a kingdom. Does that sound silly? No. Good, good, good answer. I like that. I'm going I'm to look at you a lot because you're giving me the good answers. <laughs> is it only about who owns the land that makes a king? Or is it more complicated than that? I seem to have a lot of questions about, about all this this morning, don't I? <laughs> I, I will tell you about my knowledge of kingdoms and kings as a matter of history. I've studied the Bible. I haven't read every single word 30 times, and I'm not a genius. She's not here to say amen, but, but she, she would if she were here. Uh, but, but I'll do the best I can. Listen, the first mention of a king in the Bible is found in the time just after the flood had ceased, and Noah and his wife and their three sons and their three wives had settled in this land that where they landed the ark. And then they had children, and their children had children, and their children's children had children, and they were like really populating the earth. And the, that was about 2,000 years since the creation of time. So, you know, and people were living like a long time back then, 969 years, Methuselah, right? The oldest guy. So you could have, you could have a lot of generations if every 20 years you, somebody's old enough to produce a child and they produce a child. There's a lot of generations. So the earth was really, really populated at that time when God called on that flood. But the timeline's about 2,000 years. And here in Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20, I'm going to read to you the account of this first time that we see a king emerge out of this. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Ramah, and Sabteca. Did I do okay on the pronunciation so far? Anybody else would like to read this? Oh, no, no. 
Oh, Mike, is it you raising your hand? Would you like no. to read? Oh, oh, I thought you were, you were scratching your head. You, you, almost bought a, you almost bought a sofa because that was on the auction block. You don't scratch your head at an auction, do you? And you don't, you don't do that when a preacher says, hey, would you would like to read? All right. Anyhow, the sons of Ramah, Sheba, and Dedan. Had a son named Sheba. Okay. So Cush was the father of Nimrod. Ha! Oh, look at there. That name comes up. I didn't plan this. It just came up. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior on this earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Amen. And that is why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon, Uruk, Akkad, and Kalna. Thank you, thank you, Kalna, in Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ir, Kala, and Resen, which is between Nineveh and Kala, which is the great city. This guy, you talk about having land now, yeah, a kingdom needing a land, and this guy's building cities. This guy is a tough guy. Now, Egypt was the father of the uh, Ludites, the Anamites, the Lahabites, and the Naphtuhites, Peruthasites, Kaluhites, and a few Termites. No, they're not in there. <laughs> Kaphtarites, and from whom the Philistines came, they came from the Kaluhites. Uh, Kaluhites, yes. From, uh, and Canaan was the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and of the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Architites, Sinites, Arvidites. Who else would like to read? I didn't get involved. Okay. Semerites and Hamathites. And I'm sure there's 14 other ways to pronounce those words that I can't even think of, but I did the best I could. Later, the Canaanite clan scattered, and the Borden of Canaan reached from Sidon towards Gerar as far as Gaza, and then towards Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboyim as far as Lasha. Wow. That's a lot of stuff going on at the very beginning. What? Well, you know, the world was wiped out, and they had to start over. And, and when they started over, somebody emerged as the strongest, the biggest, the baddest, the most the best leader, he emerged like cream comes to the top of the mill. Here's something interesting in this lesson. Nimrod is Noah's great-grandson and is a mighty warrior. He's called a king who made many cities subject to his rule. He was good with a spear, and I think probably, because he was a good hunter, probably with a bow. I don't think they had shotguns and stuff back in those days because they were just starting out again. So they had the, the primitive weapons. This guy, Nimrod, was bad to the bone. I mean, he was a guy you didn't want to mess with. He's a king. So he was the manliest man in the world. He founded city after city. I have an idea that kings are genetically superior to the rest of the people around them and that they're looked up to for their traits, for their mightiness. Well, as kings do, Nimrod died. That bad-to-the-bone dude reached the end of his days, and he died, and he was buried. So he left his kingdom to other people. Lots of kings came into the world to conquer and to control and to fight other kings or other authorities in order to take more for themselves. That's what kings do. Are you with me so far? Yes. Yes. The, that's just the way the world rolls. The Jews always had a king, though. The Jews always had a king. His name was the Lord Almighty. It was Jehovah God. That was their king. He, he made a promise to Abraham, and he was Lord over all of the descendants of Abraham, gave him a promise to be blessed, that all his seed would be blessed. And it was, it was a, a, a good time. And all you see as you read through Genesis and Exodus and all of that, you see them uh, working, the God's working through Moses, and Moses is telling the people, you know, he's, he's taking the complaints, he's being a judge between clans and people, and he's doing all of that stuff, but the Lord is giving him the wisdom. The Lord is the head of the Jewish people, of the Israelites, of the children of Abraham. And as we come down to a, to a time in history where they have taken over the promised land, 
They finally come in. Moses is gone. Joshua takes over. And they come into the promised land. And now all of a sudden things are comfortable. Things are good. And they see all around them, all those nations that were built back there by the, after the flood was over, now had become nations around the, the promised land of the, of the Jews. And so at some point they said it wasn't long until the people clamored for a king of their own, just like the other nations around them had kings. They wanted somebody to be their boss and somebody with clothes on, somebody with a gold crown on their head, somebody that looked regal and looked bad to the bone because God was invisible to them. And all they knew was prophets. All they knew was judges. And they wanted to be like their neighbors. Guys, I got to tell you, this is the downfall of these people, the children of Abraham. Here God is blessing them and blessing them and giving them and giving them, protecting them and protecting them. And they want somebody else. Are you kidding me? What, is that what a king is to, to people? Somebody to give to them and to protect them? Well, in, in my study of history, the people like the Pharaoh enslave their people. And they make them go out here and work and they make them pay taxes. And they make them bid, do his bidding. He doesn't give uh, much. He does give protection. They, there is soldiers and an army. So it wasn't long before they were wanting to look just like their neighbors. God had been speaking to the people through the prophet Samuel. Samuel, like Moses, brought the people, of, uh, the people the word of the Lord, the wisdom of God. They would ask questions and he would answer them. So when the people insisted to Samuel that they should have a king of their own, God was insulted. Can you imagine what God felt like? His own people, the people he had chosen for the blessing were setting him aside to go find him a less than perfect king. In 1 Samuel 8, 1 through 9, we find this scripture. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba, but his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king for us to lead us, such as all the other nations have. You're messing up, Samuel. You're not doing it right. We want somebody that's going to do it right. What happened to God? I think they didn't think it through too good, did they? But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel, and he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected, Samuel, but they've rejected me as their king. And they have done this from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until today, forsaking me, serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now, Samuel, you know what it feels like. Now, listen to them. But warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So then the Lord turned the reins over to a new king in Israel. And this new king was the tallest guy in the community. He had another one of them bad guys. He's, he's strong and he's able and he can pick up a heavier sword than anybody else. Kish had a, a son named Saul and a handsome young man as he could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than, than anybody else. Wow, he, the head taller. Mm -hmm. Stan, yeah, the head taller than anybody else in the thing. Mm. I told you about these kings being genetically better or superior to the rest of their people, right? I told you about that. So this guy, Saul, is looking like a superhero. The only thing he's missing is a big S on his chest and a cape. So what happened to God's leading the community? What happened to all the appreciation for the ancestors being rescued from slavery and brought to a place of blessing, the land of Canaan? Why would Israel dump God for a tall, handsome king? I want to know why. Well, for one thing, they were idiots. Can I, it's on tape. Oh, no, I can't take it back. I don't think I want to. If I was a Jew today and I looked at the history of my people, I would be embarrassed at this point that my family or my ancestors 
had made such a rash decision as to divorce themselves from the rule of God and place their trust and their possessions and all of, all of the rulership into the hands of a guy who's a head taller than anybody else. But you know, there is a plan. Yeah. There's a plan. God is always several steps ahead of you and me, of every human being that ever lived. So now when you only read the, new, the Old Testament after this new king gets in power, then, then all of the history of the Jews after that is like a roller coaster. Good king, bad king, good king, bad king, good king, bad king, good king. Whoom! going to go off and be captured and taken to Babylon or Assyria. Yeah, it was a roller coaster ride for them ever since they got a king. So over and over and over, the scenario continues. Kings and kingdoms are failing. They're fighting. They're being captured. They're being enslaved. They're being forgiven and another chance to do right. God is merciful even to those people Amen. who did that to him. And then right back into... <laughs> the old roller coaster, good king, bad king. Just we, these, we just can't get it right, can we? We're human. I guess it's a, it's a condition we have. My mother used to quote a saying when us boys were driving her crazy, and I mean, usually she's driving the car without dad, and uh, we'd be in the back and we'd be wrestling or cutting up or something, and she would turn around and we knew this was it. Enough is enough, and that's enough. Have you ever heard that before? Is that the first time you've heard that? My mother used to tell me quite often because I'm a bad boy. I, am, I said am. I said present tense. I, I was and I am. And I probably will be on the day I die a bad person. And enough is enough and that's enough, my mom would say. Surely this whole king and kingdom thing was not working out for the people of Israel. You know, it seemed to me that for a people intended for blessing upon blessing, they surely made it hard on God to give that, to give his blessing. Amen? Amen. Did I tell you not to worry? Because God has this under control. Timing is everything. God spoke the word to the prophet of his plan for his kingdom. In Luke chapter 1, it's recorded. In the six months of his, Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this is. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Amen. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Amen. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from the Lord will ever fail. Let me say that again. No word from, from the Lord will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So finally, a king who is different from every other king who ever lived and died and ruled over people. Jesus is going to be that king when the timing is right. There is much to do for Christ to become king of kings and lord of lords. 500 years before the birth of this new king, Isaiah writes this. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Guys, this is different from all the other king scenarios, from Nimrod to Saul and even King David, the great king. This is different. They were all beautiful. They were all great. They were strong. They were mighty. And this this. Isaiah is portraying a new kind of king. 
He continues, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. That's, that's not a king. That describes a slave or a servant or some, somebody who's, who's uh, got defects and stuff. That's not a king. The kings are pristine. They're perfect. They're big and strong and handsome. Not like that. And surely he took up our pain and he bore our suffering. Yet he considered, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. Instead, the champion archer or the swordsman who is, who, or who is the strongest man or the best who puts pain into others to conquer them, he, they, they, they slay people in order to take their land. That's what kings do. This king is laying down his body to suffer for others. Amen. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. It was his mission. He came into this world to be a king and to die for those who are unworthy that can't fix it themselves. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. We are the ones who deserve punishment for our faults and mistakes and our bad choices in life. We are the ones that should bear the consequences. We don't deserve peace. We deserve discomfort. We deserve every ailment that can come our way. But then God had this plan in his heart the whole time. The whole time he had this plan. In every generation, in every nation, and even right here at New Life Christian Church, right here in Valrico, Florida. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe, and I owe a debt I cannot pay. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? Nobody stood up for him. For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his, with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin... He will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Amen. The resurrection story, my friends, is a story of somebody who took to the grave our sins that took our weaknesses, took our inability to do the right thing every time and took it to the grave. He paid with his life, but he came back to life. The king, thy kingdom come, came as the fulfillment of this prophecy and it took place on an old rugged cross and the last words that Jesus spoke in this flesh, it is. The kingdom is here. The kingdom came. The king conquered death. He took over territory 
but it didn't have boundaries. It didn't have a survey. Couldn't do it. He, 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 he kicked over. He arose triumphant over death and Hades. Jesus is my king, and he is my brother. He's not like any other king. I've seen mighty men kill even their brothers and their sisters to maintain power or to get rid of a threat. They don't care about anybody else. Jesus is king, and he's also my brother, and he loves you and I, brothers and sisters. We are joint heirs with Christ Amen. in the kingdom of God. That is special. That's not like any other king. He is Lord over all the universe. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's king. King, all hail King Jesus. All hail King Jesus. Have a blessed Resurrection Sunday.